Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Anna Seifkin with the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. We're going to let everyone say a good good morning before they turn their cameras off. Good morning. And then we're going to say, good morning. <laughs> we are very glad to have you here with us. And I'm going to move us into speaker view. So thank you so much uh, mm. for being with us this morning. Um, as I mentioned, I'm with the Scott Institute, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, how this event came together. So as you know, there's been a lot of activity in the city of Pittsburgh um, over the last um, months and years related to energy planning, um, looking at city district energy, et cetera. So what we've done this morning in partnership with the mayor, who should be joining us shortly, is uh, pulled together um, some experts from the Pittsburgh region to talk about those important issues. Um, so we have folks that are here from some of our local utilities. Uh, folks from our local university community, um, as well as staff from the city of Pittsburgh. So as I mentioned, I'm with the Scott Institutes for Energy Innovation. We are the hub at Carnegie Mellon University, specifically looking at um, energy research partnerships and entrepreneurship. Um, we worked with the city of Pittsburgh about a year ago to, it was a year ago, almost two years ago now, on a smart data utility course through the Heinz College. And as a part of that, we talked about the importance of collaboration um, and pulling together resources to make sure that um, all of our systems are sort of working together at a utility level. And that has strong benefits in terms of resiliency, particularly in light of things like pandemic. Uh, so we wanted to sort of really dive into those things today. So the first thing I wanna do is see if we have the mayor on, and if not, Grant Irvin, I'm gonna kick it over to you. The mayor is there. The mayor is here. I so, am right here. Great. <laughs> so, um, sure, go ahead, I'm sorry. So mayor, I'm gonna give you a quick little introduction this morning and thank you so much for joining us. Sure, and it's great to have Grant on as well. Hey Grant, do you know if uh, James was able to get the slide over to CMU? Um, I have not seen it yet, no. Will you check in? I will. Thank you. So. Uh, mayor William Peduto took office as Pittsburgh's 60th mayor in January of 2014. So prior to taking office, he worked for 19 years on the Pittsburgh City Council, seven years as a staffer and 12 years as a member of the council. So in 2015, Mayor Peduto signed a unique agreement with the U.S. Department of Energy to make the city a world leader in district energy production, and Pittsburgh joined the UN's Compact of Mayors, a global coalition of climate leaders committed to local action and global impact. So recently, Mayor Peduto joined the mayors across the world to reaffirm Pittsburgh's commitment to the Paris Agreement and efforts to combat climate change. Mayor Peduto joined with mayors from seven cities across Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia, and partnered with the University of Pittsburgh, other universities like Carnegie Mellon, and other research institutions to create the Marshall Plan for Middle America, which is a roadmap that lays out a strategy for regional cooperation. So with that, Mayor, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks, Anna. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for putting this together. Uh, I'll let Grant get a little bit more into the details of it, but what the Marshall Plan for Middle America is, is an economic development strategy to rebuild the heart of America. Uh, we, we pride ourselves in Northern Appalachia and through the Ohio Valley for basically building this country. Every bridge, every skyscraper, it all came from us and it came from smaller communities that surround the larger metro areas, whether those are Huntington or Morgantown, West Virginia, Pittsburgh or Youngstown, Columbus, Dayton, Cincinnati, Ohio or Louisville, Kentucky. Each of our areas have a unique part in American history during the second part of the Industrial Revolution. And during that history, we relied heavily upon fossil fuels. And in fact, today, those same communities are upheld and basically survive by jobs within the fossil fuel industry. In order to be able to make a just transition, in order to be able to recognize that the future may not be wedded to the past, we have to have a plan for how we transition our region into a renewable 
and a clean energy system. And in order to be able to do that, we need to invest in the parts of this country that have been left behind. We need to have a proactive federal policy that sees investment being made where equity is being spent. In other words, we need to partner with the companies that call this region home in order to be able to see those companies expand. Let's, let's look right down the street from Carnegie Mellon, uh, right down at Phipps, and look at one of the greenest buildings in all of the world. And eventually that is where we will get to. I mean, not, maybe not today, maybe not in our lifetime, but eventually the future of energy will be based upon the building itself providing the energy that it needs. And that's what they had done at Phipps um, with their uh, living building challenge. They have created a building that uses no more energy than a flower. It's able to capture rain in order to be able to provide water without needing an entire system around it. It's able to heat and electrify the building by using natural resources. And one by one, slowly by slowly, that's the way the world's going to evolve. Now, what's most interesting about that building is that all the materials that were used, all the engineering, the architecture, the design, all of the science behind it was produced within a 100 mile radius meaning that we have that ability to create a whole new industry, many new industries right here in Appalachia and to be able to provide it to the world. Now, if you look down at Cincinnati, right now they are experimenting with the largest solar field in the United States, Cincinnati. And it's being led by a minority owned firm. If you look into Louisville and see what they're doing with broadband in order to be able to expand it to provide critical and necessary infrastructure to everybody. And at that same time, following and working in Pittsburgh's lead on artificial intelligence. If you look down in West Virginia and what they've been able to do with solar energy or go to Youngstown and see right outside of Lordstown where electrification of public transit is not being purchased from China, but is being made in the United States, then you'll understand we're already on this journey. And this journey will be in different increments. The next increment will be on direct energy and how cities and regions are finding ways to power their neighborhoods and their areas with energy that's produced right here. In the city of Pittsburgh, we have partnered with Aarhus in Denmark, which is 100% powered by direct energy. It's not this far off idea of George Jetson. It's what's happening today in order for Pittsburgh to be the leader in North America of bringing that here. And we have examples right down the street from Carnegie Mellon. We have a steam plant that is, produces the energy and they thought about this a hundred years ago to fuel the buildings around Carnegie Mellon and Oakland. Now imagine if we worked with Carnegie Mellon and Pitt and we created a 21st century model for it that could provide the energy for all of Oakland for the families that are living there, a more resilient system, a lower cost, a more efficient way to heat and electrify their homes, and then go down the street and you get into Uptown where we're partnering with a company right now in order to be able to provide the energy to Mercy Hospital, Duquesne University, the entire development that the penguins are doing on that 28 acres and the Hill District. And connecting those systems in a way that provide backup if necessary. 
and then go downtown. Keep coming down Fifth and Forbes all the way to downtown in the Golden Triangle, where a 100-year-old plus system that has not been invested in for decades is falling apart and creating a public-private partnership to modernize the entire area and to expand it back into the Strip District. So now you're not only coming down the Monongahela and by the way, jumping down the hill to Hazelwood where the foundation community has committed to powering its 178 acres at the site of the last steel mill in Pittsburgh with renewable energy, but connecting that back up into Oakland to the uptown in the hill to downtown and now into the strip. And if you can see that happening in between the rivers, then imagine what happens across the river, into the north side, across the 16th Street Bridge, which takes you to the Heinz factory. On the other side of that road is a big area, an area of undeveloped potential that will be developed as we see the Strip District grow. And imagine creating an energy system that's a direct energy system, not only for that area, but allowing it to extend into Deutschtown, into East Allegheny, along the East Ohio Street Boulevard, and into Spring Garden. And seeing that area connected to the Strip, and then all you have to do is go down the river a little bit more. And right by Allegheny Center, you'll see a center based off of steam that has been co a co-generation site with gas that's able to produce both electricity and heat for the area around the stadiums, all the way down into the casino area. And working with a developer now in developing the area all the way past the West End Bridge, an area called Chateau, where a development plan is being built and where it can all be fueled by direct energy. Now, there's a lot of different sources, right? We, 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 we obviously know about solar. We, we know about the potential of hydro with our, our, our rivers. Uh, there's the potential of wind power, but there's also the potential of hydrogen. And hydrogen will be one of those industries that will start to be built in North America just as it is being built in Asia and in Europe. And the question is where, which takes us back to the Marshall Plan. By making those strategic investments with federal dollars that match against state tax credits that match with investments from local governments through use of pension funds and union pension funds, we can partner with the companies that are here today. The companies that have been here for over 100 years to be the companies that will be here a hundred years from now. And we can make sure that those communities that surround our metro areas are getting the support and technical advice from our universities, Marshall University in Huntington, WVU in Morgantown, Carnegie Mellon and Pitt in Pittsburgh, Youngstown State in Youngstown, Ohio State in Columbus, University of Dayton in Dayton, University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, University of Louisville in Louisville, in a strategic partnership between government, academia, and corporations. And to make sure that our neighbors in Connellsville, in Carmichael, in Uniontown, and in Weirton, have an opportunity to be a part of the future and not have to fear the future. We've had the wrong approach. The approach to being able to meet the Paris agreements should be looked at as economic opportunity. We have allowed the narrative to be that climate change is a conspiracy instead of it's an opportunity for you and your families to prosper and we need to change it. And it's not gonna be changed in Burlington, Vermont, or in the Bronx, New York, or in Berkeley, California. That narrative is going to be changed in middle America, in Pittsburgh, in Louisville, 
in Huntington, West Virginia. And it's going to be changed around people and how people are at the center of an economic development revolution. And that the, those same people that built America once are going to be asked to build America again. That's the Marshall Plan. A different approach to getting to the same goals of the Paris Agreement by investing in the areas that otherwise would be left behind. A way to be able to talk up to our neighbors instead of talking down. And with that, I will ask if Grant has anything to add more on the operational side, the budget side, uh, or the strategic side of how we get this done. But I'll, I'll leave you with this. The next critical step is getting the support of the universities to speak up about their importance and their role in being able to make this plan successful. Because in the 21st century, the critical infrastructure is academia. The critical component is not how fast and how we can get coal up a river or on a railroad. It's how we can get information to our neighbors and to help, to, and to help them to be able to build back. Um, with that, I can look at the example that we've created with Carnegie Mellon in 2015, where we created the first MOU between a city and a university in American history. And that led to the creation of the Metro network of over 20 cities and nearly 30 universities that have all done the same thing. And where we've been able to create not only innovation in our cities through these partnerships, but we've created new businesses within our regions. That example needs to be taken to that next step. And that's what makes the Marshall Plan different than almost any plan that we have looked at in American history. Grant? Thanks, Mayor, I appreciate it. Um, we have, uh, also James just sent me uh, your slide if you wanted to, wanted me to share that. Yeah, if you could show folks what that vision is for the city of Pittsburgh and how close we are to being there in the next five years. Five years. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, James reminded me that he is a PowerPoint wizard, not a mapping wizard. But, you know, to the mayor's point, <laughs> we're uh, focusing in on the areas really in the orange and in the red. Um, right Can you now, use your remember, pointer, Grant? So when you look at uh, kind of the operations that the mayor talks about in downtown, northwest, central and south Oakland, uptown, Hazelwood, the Strip District, Chateau, the north side, you know, so these areas are, are kind of critical infrastructure, critical energy infrastructure in terms of the city's operations, as well as kind of our, our built environment um, for obvious reasons, the density of buildings, the density, importance of services. We have a lot of those partners here today that we're going to be talking in greater detail about some of the activities um, that they're leading, as well as kind of the, the work that we're doing in the city team in collaboration with a lot of the universities, institutions, uh, and partners in the nonprofit and, and building sector. Um, and it's a critical opportunity that we leverage these assets as we start to fulfill the, the vision that the mayor is laying out with regards to the Marshall Plan. Um, so the investment that is required, it's incumbent upon all of us to activate that. Um, but there's a host of opportunity areas beyond uh, kind of where we're, we're focusing our intentional investments right now and focus in Oakland and downtown and the North Shore, because those next generation places like Chateau and the Strip District, the build out of Uptown and Hazelwood um, are things that we need to start putting on our radar now in order to plan for the future. Mayor, do you have other things to, to add here with regards to kind of the, the locations and the opportunities? No, I, I would just say that as we're looking at this, and I don't know if my pointer is there or not, but lower Lawrenceville all the way down to the Strip is an entire area that is basically under reconstruction right now. 
downtown already has the system in place and we're updating it. Uptown system is being built as we speak. Oakland is the opportunity and the critical linchpin of connecting down to Hazelwood, where we have the commitment from the foundation community to be 100% renewable. As we look at the area of Lower Lawrenceville and the Strip District, going directly across the bridge at 16th in this yellow area, that is the area that is under redevelopment going into the north side and beginning up. The area that is red right here is already and presently a co-generation uh, area and the area being developed along the riverfront and Chateau. When we look at this entire area, and Grant, if you'd like to talk just a little bit about it, we're looking at an area also which uh, the majority of the major buildings are a part of our 2030 plan uh, in being able to reduce the energy in the most dense parts of the city of Pittsburgh. And with a 2030 plan, we are a part of a global network uh, of working with cities around the, the country and around the world. Uh, but more importantly, we lead that global network in energy reduction. And that is through a partnership that we have with the great partner, the Green Building Alliance. That's right. We have the, the largest, um, and Anna, Anna can speak to this intimately, but we have the, the largest 2030 districts in the world. Is that right, Anna? Um, it is. So Green Building Alliance continues to uh, manage the largest by far of all of the districts. I think there are 25 or 26 other cities, um, but we still carry about a quarter of all square footage. So Christy Silak is on the phone today from Green Building Alliance um, listening in, and she appreciates the, the shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, thank you for the great work. And not only that, if you think about that in, as a two-prong approach, uh, not simply building out the energy system, but creating more efficient buildings at that same time. Meeting the 2030 and the 2050 goals become completely doable and not only doable, but uh, possibly even much sooner than what we think. You know, our goal was as a city to be 100% uh, renewable energy fueled for our operation side by 2030. We met that this year. Yeah. And the idea is if we can do it as a city, especially a city like Pittsburgh, I mean, we're not Boulder, Colorado, we're Pittsburgh, you know? And if we can set that example, it makes all of these other goals seem so real and possible. We have this wonderful opportunity to be able to be the definition of how we're able to do this. And people will look and go, huh, Pittsburgh? Huh, then why aren't we doing it? More so than cities that are already are running off of hydropower, telling the rest of the country, that's what you need to do too. Coal was discovered on our Monongahela River. Oil was discovered up in Venango County. We sit on the Marcellus and the Utica shale reserves, and yet we see a different future. It's not based upon fossil fuel, but willing to work with the companies that built those industries to expand their portfolio so they're still here 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. Mayor, do you have uh, thoughts you might want to share um, just while we have you here about other opportunity areas like uh, um, just from city operations standpoint about like the, the, the VA site or the, the area around the 62nd Street Bridge, um, some of these kind of, you know, development areas and, and you know, other things where we might ant have anticipation in the future for things to chew on, for folks to chew on. Nope, I have no idea what you're talking about. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, th th those are the easier ones. Those are the ones where we already have control of the land and the site. So as you're going down Washington Boulevard uh, on the right-hand side, that whole hillside is basically owned by the URA. And then on top of the hill is a former VA site, which we have been in negotiations with the federal government for four years to purchase. Um, and as we look at the redevelopment of that site uh, for city operations, which was part of the agreement with the federal government, 
in being able to obtain the land, it's a very easy add-on to put a partnership with a private company to be able to provide the energy for the site as we redevelopment. The same thing around 62nd Street and all down the, uh, the Allegheny River uh, in Upper Lawrenceville, uh, where we own that land as well. And it, it also the same thing as we look at the Strip District in going towards Lawrenceville, so much of that is city owned land that we can make the agreements with any new developer as we sell that land to be developed where this needs to be a component of it. So on the city owned land side of it, uh, it's a given. And it's not only that, it's... It, sorry. It's not only that, it is the opportunity to be able to look at something like the former Western Pennsylvania Penitentiary and to be able to see it as an opportunity, not only for redevelopment along the Ohio River, but also a partnership with its neighbor, Alcasan, and how we can capture methane at our sewage facility in order to be able to produce energy to help to create the energy to fuel that, that center of Alcasan. That methane capture can be combined with solid waste through a transfer station, and we could be able to use that to end our landfills and to partner with our neighbors and surrounding communities to do the same. Not only being able to produce energy, but to greatly reduce the cost of solid waste in getting to the point of zero waste. These are the opportunities that are before us right now. But the only way to make them happen is if we have a federal program to help us to get there. And again, that goes back to the Marshall Plan. We can meet our goals of the Paris Agreement. We can surpass our goals. We can build out industries. And as the Marshall Plan numbers show through the study that was done at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, that in the next 10 years, our region is going to lose 100 thousand jobs in the fossil fuel industry. 40,000 of those jobs will be lost in the state of West Virginia alone. But if we invest in these new industries, we will create over 400,000 jobs in the next 10 years. It's a pretty compelling reason to make that investment. And it's an area that deserves that type of attention. The, the arithmetic is easy. So I have a quick question. Um, and, and I do want to let folks know that um, we will have Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A section. Mayor, thank you so much for your comments this morning. Thanks. So there's a lot of, with a new administration at the national level, how does the local plan that we're working on, this regional plan, fit in? How will that all come together? What's your well, vision? It, it requires collaboration. Um, that collaboration, like I said, really needs to be built out at uh, a local level. We view uh, Reimagine Appalachia as our strategic partner. Uh, we support their agenda. We support uh, their policies like recreating the CCC and being able to put people directly into jobs immediately. Uh, we have a workforce that's ready, willing, and able to be able to take care of a lot of the public needs that um, are presently are just being ignored and allowing to become much more costly. So working with Reimagine Appalachia on the grassroots support and combining that with our political support, we look to our brothers and sisters in organized labor and we view them as critical partners because when we talk about good jobs and green jobs, they should be the same. This is the region that created the Blue Green Alliance between the Sierra Club and the United Steelworkers and understood issues such as fair trade were issues that we need to get behind. I believe that that same type of an alliance can help to rebuild and to be able to put together a lobbying power in Washington to help us to get that through. 
And then we look uh, at uh, strategic partners, whether that is academia or whether it is the private companies of this region themselves, companies that are looking to expand or looking to move to this region in order to expand. Uh, we want to be able to have them as our partner in being able to make that lobbying effort as well. We've been in touch with the Biden campaign uh, during the election on the Build Back Better uh, plan and spoke with the authors of that plan about how this fits in with what they're doing and want to do. And we've had early conversations with the Biden transition team uh, to really start to put more flesh on the bones of uh, what this study shows and being able to look at, you know, this uh, four state area as one. I think the, the last thing that we would ever want to do is to try to compete against our brothers and sisters in West Virginia or Ohio or Kentucky. Uh, more so, we want to be able as mayors to look at our metro areas uh, beyond our own cities and to be able to show a contiguous map uh, and to be able to show uh, an economic uh, stale stalling uh, that has left those areas behind, whether they're in urban areas or rural areas, and to be able to end this rural urban debate and to be able to show that people being left behind um, in Uniontown are not different than people being left behind in Homewood. Thank you, Mayor. I certainly appreciate your comments and we are glad to have you here this morning. So Grant, I know that you have some slides that you'd like to share with us as well. Um, and Mayor, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you for your leadership, your ongoing leadership in, the, in these areas. So thank you for that. Thank you. I've got a lot of great colleagues that I work with day by day like Grant. And I got a lot of good friends that are mayors of these other cities where we share the stories of not only the uh, economic duress, but the proud stories that we like to talk about of the successes that keep shining through. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, so you, know, you want me to kind of move our, our uh, slide deck here to go a little bit deeper into detail? Let me uh, queue up. So, uh, is that uh, visible for folks? Um, it is. So it yeah, is. Thank you, Grant. Uh, yeah. So uh, the team put together a, a slide deck, and and for for some folks this is new content. For some folks this is um, a bit of an update from some of the work that we've done over the last uh, few months with our partners. From uh, as Mayor the Mayor mentioned, we've been partnering with the City of Aarhus and the. Uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Ministry and Energy Department in uh, uh, the country of Denmark, um, who have become really close friends and partners of ours in developing kind of this energy vision. And one of the things we wanted to do with folks today um, is, is, you know, uh, one kind of have the mayor kind of tee things up with the large vision and um, why the Marshall Plan is so important and, and start to dig into how cities and how a city like Pittsburgh can, can activate that vision uh, from the ground up and some of the work that we've been um, doing wanted to share with you all. So I'm gonna go through this relatively briefly. There's a lot of detail underneath of this, um, but we wanted to share some uh, results of work that we've done throughout uh, 2021, which has uh, been uh, really fundamental for the activation of the city's climate action plan, um, our 2030 strategy as well as a key component of, as the mayor mentioned, the city's economic development strategy. So the idea that energy and economic development and social health and well-being, they're all interconnected. Um, and that's one of the key messages that we wanted to share with folks today. Um, so as part of that, you know, our commitment is really to build an economy through green and clean energy. Um, and that is one of the, the foundations really through the DNA of Pittsburgh. Um, as the mayor mentioned, you know, energy has always been a part of uh, who and what Pittsburgh is, uh, whether it's, it's coal in the Monongahela River or oil, oil slicks that came down the Allegheny, um, there were uh, energy at, at the core component of the work that we all do. 
And that's going to be true going forward into the future. So as we lead this green energy transition, it's incumbent upon all of us, um, the city, the universities, the institutions, um, the built and uh, leaders in the built environment to make these strategic decisions to make the clean energy transition possible. A lot of this work isn't, uh, has been a, a building block effort from us. Um, if you go back to the 2008 and uh, you know, the mayor's leadership as a council person in initiating the initial climate action plan, um, on to the development of the P4 principles um, as you took office in 2014 um, to today where we're starting to conduct uh, citywide energy planning where um, I'm pretty safe to say um, there might be one, maybe two other cities in, in the United States that are doing the type of energy and planning related work that we are doing. So we're a bit of on a frontier right now and trying to figure out um, how to advance kind of a clean energy ecosystem uh, with our utility partners, um, with our building partners, um, and designing kind of policies and codes for the future for that, that architecture that's required to develop uh, this strategy, the Marshall Plan for Middle America. Um, you know, one of the things that we noted as we were developing the Marshall Plan uh, concept with our partners at Reimagine Appalachia and the Heartland Institute and the Center for Sustainable Business at the University of Pittsburgh, is that in Pittsburgh, we already have this ecosystem, um, kind of a, a, the ability to create a, a, a replicable system for other cities to realize this Marshall Plan vision. Um, and it starts with setting the climate and energy priorities uh, for the city. So those 2030 targets, our guideposts, our milestones that we've set ourselves out for. It's about integrated project design and delivery. So kind of integrating uh, these collaborative ventures with utilities, with universities to help uh, create the enabling environment for the development of our economy, for the workforce, um, and then leveraging that investment from the federal, state, um, private sector, and the local levels. Um, so we're making these investments, for example, through pension funds, through our procurement decisions, but we need that federal and state investment to be the catalyst. Um, a great example is, you know, just yesterday we received an award from the Pennsylvania Energy Development Authority uh, for our second avenue EV uh, 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 launch site, where we're deploying right now about 30 vehicles that have switched already over to electrified vehicle um, drivetrains. But that investment from the state has been absolutely essential in order for us to kind of deliver the infrastructure required for those vehicles. Just a couple of weeks ago, we uh, hosted a, a workshop with uh, many of our local partners um, that we called the City of the Future Workshop um, to basically start to lay out kind of what these next steps in this clean energy transition are going to be for Pittsburgh. And one of the things that uh, was, I think, a hallmark of all of the attendees, well over 100 people, um, was the sense of urgency, um, the importance of where we are right now in the climate crisis, the opportunity that we have as a city, um, and then the opportunity that is, is coming forward with uh, the transition uh, in Washington with the new administration coming in. So our ability to be in position and take advantage of kind of the what comes next and what needs to come next is really incumbent upon decisions that we all collectively make. So with that, there's a couple of things that we've, we've identified um, as a city team that we can help uh, you know, partners kind of make advance and fulfill this vision. One is the development of the city's comprehensive plan, uh, Forge PGH, which was launched earlier this summer, and integrating energy into the development of that, that comprehensive land use strategy. Um, I should note it's the first time that the city will be developing uh, in its uh, over 200 year history, a comprehensive land use plan. And the idea that energy is a key component or building block of that is really critical. Um, but the other thing is, is that, as the mayor said, we need your participation. We need your buy-in if you're a building owner, if you're a utility, if you're a university or uh, an institution or hospital. These are critical because of the makeup of the city um, and the ability for your organization to make commitments to have dialogues with your stakeholders um, and advocate collectively with us for the support of new policies, regulations um, is absolutely critical to the fulfillment of this. So a couple of things that the workshop started to lay out was this opportunity around economic resilience through green energy. Um, and that takes place in 
in kind of four areas, built environment, infrastructure, governance, and efficiency. Um, so the idea that we can make investments in the built, in, in built environment, that we can reinvest and modernize our infrastructure, that we create the systems, uh, the governance systems, the networks that could help us deliver projects, and that we focus on efficiency first. Um, so one of the hallmarks that we see, obviously we mentioned the partnership with the 2030 district is that the majority of our emissions are coming from these large buildings. Um, so the effect of us to, to tune up those buildings, to put the policy and investment um, decisions into them to help guide efficiency helps us also kind of guide consumption. Just to go into those in a little bit greater detail, the, the blue boxes here are some of the, the, the tools that we've identified uh, in terms of how we can advance this or help advance and fulfill this vision uh, of the Marshall Plan from the ground up. Um, we've used tools in the Strip District and in, on the, in the riverfronts uh, around what we call points, uh, performance points related to sustainable energy decisions. We're looking to expand that citywide um, in order to help advance and provide that nudge and also kind of acknowledge uh, high performance buildings uh, as a key component uh, in towards the built environment. Um, it's about kind of developing and deploying new policy and regulatory tools. Um, a great example is uh, you're going to hear a little bit later on from uh, some folks on our team about our net zero energy ordinance that we developed for city facilities. And that is leading uh, a really kind of a change in the marketplace in terms of the professional uh, focus on net zero and passive house structures, but also building the workforce to help deliver those types of projects. Um, but it's also about expanding green building advisory reviews. So all of the projects that come through uh, city planning and, and through kind of our, our building review to give them insights into their energy use and building for poor performance opportunities is going to be critical, both for big buildings and for small buildings. I'm going to skip over some of these details in the performance point system. You'll hear more about that later. Um, this is a little bit about kind of the locations where they serve now. So again, looking to service this kind of across uh, major districts and citywide. Building efficiency has been a, a, a key tool and just a, a note to kind of our partners at Allegheny County who this, this past week announced um, the release of the CPACE program, the Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing, um, which is really gonna be a critical tool we feel in terms of advancing building performance through financing uh, here in, in Allegheny County in the city of Pittsburgh. Building efficiency and monitoring and, and detailing uh, information has been really critical to our work in the city. Um, this slide shows some of the buildings that are currently uh, uh, in the RFP stages of develop of advancing our net zero energy uh, uh, code, um, as well as on the, on the left is kind of the baseline performance that uh, Fleur Marion, who you're gonna meet in a little bit, um, has been able to compile for all 300 facilities. Um, so understanding our portfolio has been a really critical component of our advancement of energy efficiency and, and on our way towards meeting our 50% emissions reduction and energy consumption target. It's also uh, critical for us to help advance on infrastructure and modernizing infrastructure. We've listened to, to our utility partners um, and heard about you know, the challenges of deploying infrastructure across the city. And so one of the things that we're, we're poised to do is to help to be a better partner with regards to developing upfront planning and long range planning um, and understanding and sharing information with utility partners to be more strategic. Um, we have the benefit of understanding kind of what's happening from a, a transaction standpoint and, and development uh, process. So how can we get out ahead and coordinate better to reduce uh, costs through kind of reduce delays? Um, is one of the key targets that we see uh, in terms of long range planning with utilities, but also kind of working hand in hand in terms of understanding uh, district scale development. And as the mayor pointed out, uh, knowing what's going to happen three, four, five years down the line so that we can collectively get ahead um, and think about energy first, um, which has been one of the key mantras that we have started to advance. As we talked a little bit about earlier, um, we're looking to do some more detailed mapping and scenario analysis. Um, the mayor mentioned some of the key sites that are currently in the city's portfolio, like the Veterans Administration site, the 62nd Street Bridge, 
We've talked a lot about the Lower Hill District in recent months um, and some of the work that is being done there. Um, really trying to get out in front of opportunities uh, as we see them in order to build the next generation energy infrastructure so that as we go vertical, those building decisions become uh, more and more easier with regards to sustainability solutions. Governance is also a key component of this. Um, one of the key things that we've identified over the, the work that we've done in the last several months has been uh, the opportunity to create energy improvement districts. Um, the state of Pennsylvania, like many states, has uh, what are called NIDs or BIDs, neighborhood improvement districts or business improvement districts, uh, which pr provide opportunities to bring financing from building owners and property owners to make infrastructure upgrades um, or service upgrades. Um, so we're seeing critical opportunities where we can get up in front of uh, particular district scale developments and with that energy first mentality to start to think about how we build this, the financial services packages to leverage collaborative infrastructure investments like charging networks or smart city technologies um, or other types of tools that will benefit residents and customers um, that, are, that are consumers of those districts. So those are some one of the tools that we're looking to advance over the next one to two years. The second is leveraging the work of our authority partners, um, whether the URA, the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, or the Parking Authority. Um, we've done a lot of really great innovation uh, and deployment of projects over the last several years with regards to energy efficiency and LED technology, um, electric uh, vehicles, um, but looking towards taking kind of that next step um, in terms of how do we leverage the development cycle, real estate um, and capital investment to start to advance energy infrastructure deployment. And then finally, creating an energy committee within the Department of City Planning. Um, so this opportunity to start to bring in expertise early on um, as we review and guide project decisions um, is one of the ways that we feel that we can help to elevate um, the role of energy uh, and energy decision making through the development cycle. And then uh, the efficient city. This is a, the concepts of really thinking about the city's work and our internal operations. Um, as a, you know, an entity that has 3,000 employees, 300 facilities, and 1,000 fleet vehicles, how do we really integrate energy and sustainability across city operations? Um, we've made great strides in the last uh, several years with regards to increasing the amount of uh, electric vehicles in our fleet. As the mayor mentioned, we hit our 100% renewable electricity uh, consumption this year through a, a new contract that we devised with uh, partners at Direct Energy um, and are looking to take the next steps, which we're going to learn more about in terms of entering into uh, a whole, the wholesale market, which will allow us to advance power purchase agreements while reducing risk, but more importantly, find ways to invest in clean renewable energy in southwestern Pennsylvania. So really looking to help advance that market. One of the other great things about, um, you know, kind of as a result of those standards that we've created and targets in renewable energy, we've also helped to uh, amass savings through our partners in the Western Pennsylvania Energy Consortium. Um, so our, that ab ability to have an aggregated purchasing power not only helps us to reduce costs, we saved $700,000 for local governments uh, just this past year, but also expand our renewable footprint um, here in the region. And it's also about um, integrating with communities. Um, so a, a big piece of our work uh, on our team has been around the challenges of fuel poverty or energy burden. Um, so, you know, up ahead, how do we start to find ways to advance energy efficiency in the residential sector um, is gonna be one of the critical tools that we have in the future. Just some, some final thoughts. Um, uh, one of the, the mayor had mentioned also kind of the the changes that we've been able to make uh, from the, the Pittsburgh Pension Board and their leadership in developing an ESG policy for our pension. Um, this is kind of, uh, everybody asked me, why is this a big deal? Um, and you know, effectively what we've been able to do is to divest our pension fund uh, to less than 1% of our fund is being exposed to fossil fuels. And this is transformative because it also allows the opportunity to invest locally in clean energy and community building assets. Um, so the, the focus of the SG policy is a fundamental shift in our procurement practices. 
And one of the things that we're asking other partners to start to investigate with their own kind of investment funds. So how do we, one, create kind of environmental social governance policies, but also how do we make those investments locally? I talked about the energy consortium and strategic energy planning, um, the energy committee. And with that, um, Anna, I'm gonna turn it back over to you so we can get back on time here. Thank you, Grant. So um, I know that we have questions. There are some questions that are coming in through the Q&A, um, but I wanna get to the next couple of panels. I think we should abbreviate each of the individual panels to about 15 minutes. So I will be your new timekeeper. And with that, our first panel is the um, uh, staff from the city of Pittsburgh. So if you will um, enable your cameras, I'm gonna put us back on a grid view. And so those of you that are speaking now, um, so that would be Floor and Sarah and Derek. Fantastic. All right, so now the, the three of you are um, gonna be giving us some additional updates. Um, I can make you a co-host if you'd like to share slides, but generally speaking, we have about 15 minutes. So um, with that, um, who am I passing this to? Derek, are you gonna start us off? Actually, who's starting? Floor, are you starting? I think Catherine was gonna take, uh, give us some questions, but I see we also have questions here. So should we try to address some of the questions on the chat or? Well, no, that's, I think that um, we should probably go ahead. I'm gonna, so Katrine, are you available? I'm gonna start your video. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Of course, can you see me? Not yet. I'm not able to put on my video, but. <laughs> try that, try again. Nope. Okay. Doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we had, um, we've just uh, briefly talked about the, or Grant has just briefly talked about the Climate and Energy Committee. And uh, I would like Derek uh, to maybe go a little more into detail on uh, what role uh, the committee could play and what's in thought here. Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Derek Duff and I'm a, I'm a, a planner at the Department of City Planning. Um, and um, one of the things that we've been talking about is, is the need for um, an advisory body to serve the city uh, on our projects and to make sure that we're tapping all the knowledge and expertise that's, that's here in the, in the city and the region. Um, so the idea of the energy and the climate and energy committee is just that it's to sort of put together this expert panel that can help us to navigate these waters and make sure that our projects are the most effective and efficient they can be. Um, in terms of, of what this, this committee would do, um, a whole host of things really. Um, you know, the more that we talk about it, the more expansive it gets. But you know, some of the projects that Grant talked about earlier are sort of key things that we would wanna see this committee look at. You know, obviously, as the mayor noted and as Grant noted, the Oakland Energy Master Planning work is really one of those top priorities for the city. It is that place where we can start to prove that we can grow our research development and our economy with that at the same time that we're eliminating greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it's and it's also, I think, an example of the sort of collaborations that we're trying to create. So, you know, it is co-led by the Green Building Alliance, and we're working in partnership with Carnegie Mellon University, University of Pittsburgh, UPMC, Carly University, Duquesne Light, and other utilities. So um, this project is one that we'd like to see come before the committee and to, to benefit from the, the expertise at that committee. Um, other programs that Grant talked about, uh, the idea of expanding the performance point system. So for people that aren't familiar with this, this is a bonus uh, height program that was created to implement the Eco Innovation District and P4 in the Uptown area. We really like to expand that citywide as a part of the comprehensive planning process. So it would allow more bonus height um, or other potential incentives for development projects, so long as they can meet uh, goals of the community and goals of the city around um, climate action. Um, and so there's already a, a pretty good menu of those and they're already applied to uptown and the riverfront areas, but expanding them citywide is gonna take an update to those points into that system and then thinking sort of more holistically about what that means in different parts of the city where we might wanna see more height. Um, We've also heard from other cities that it's really important for us to proactively develop guidelines and standards so that those don't become impediments to the rollout of this energy future, whether that's EV charging or district energy facilities. 
And so we do really see this committee as really serving as a, a bridging a gap between a lot of the work that's done on energy and design and, um, and development. And so developing standards around those different kinds of, um, of infrastructure improvements and making sure that we're ready to go so that that doesn't slow things down. Um, and I think one of the things that, that maybe is a little bit different from this is that we are uh, interested in learning about and, and potentially developing some other ways of funding these projects. We've heard a lot from many of you on this call that the upfront capital costs are very high and a major impediment to developing district energy and a whole host of other energy systems. And so one of the things that we're interested in working with this, this uh, expert panel on is what are those different pathways? Uh, you know, Philadelphia has an energy authority. Is that the right approach? Um, we also have the ability to create uh, improvement districts. Is that the way to do this? So um, I think that would be a major project and really something that the city could benefit from this energy and climate panel. Mm. Thank you, Derek. Um, Flo, I know also that uh, you have another meeting coming up soon. So I'm just going to uh, ask you to talk a little about the uh, city commitment for um, 2021 on uh, building efficiency. Um, I know mm. I just briefly touched upon it, but um, some more detail, please. <laughs> yes. So as Grant uh, uh, described, we've been uh, taking stock of our own municipal portfolio. And uh, I've passed a net zero ready uh, ordinance earlier this year. And we've already incorporated in the RFPs. Uh, so those were just few pictures of some of the buildings. Uh, there's many more coming and a couple of those projects are already in construction phase. So soon we should start seeing how, uh, how successful we are at retrofitting older building or building new building to a near passive house standard. And we're hoping that by, um, by leading by example, uh, we would help create a change in the market because we did see that change in the answers to our RFP. Once we asked for a better performance, we did obtain them from, from the community. So the, the knowledge is here in Pittsburgh to, to, to build those buildings. Uh, that's for us, uh, for, the, um, for the private sector and to meet this 50% energy reduction at the city level, we need work on our buildings. And as uh, some of you in the, in the public here knows, uh, but not maybe everyone, the, um, the building code is really the place you, you intervene to change, uh, to improve energy efficiency. But those are done at the state level. So uh, sometimes um, there's a conundrum here that we can't really tell people how to make their, their building better because we don't do the building code. Well, the, the first thing we did this year that was different is that as a city, we participated in the voting process to design the, the future uh, energy code that would be proposed to the state. So we did vote. There was a huge participation across the US from the city uh, um, organization body. And uh, the, the vote was over, overwhelmingly, sorry, for uh, energy efficiency. So uh, for the 2021 code, we see 10% improvement in energy efficiency. And that's the, the biggest jump from one, one, uh, one code to the other that's been proposed. But now this needs to be adopted at the state level. So there's gonna be an, a lobbying effort and a consultation and education effort to be done to try to, to get those um, adopted at the state level, but we did that first step. And so that's a, that's a huge success in itself. And we're gonna need your participation, everyone in, in this meeting to help us uh, make the state understand the importance of those. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other thing we can do is uh, improve what we already do, uh, make it better and broader. So Derek touched on that. We have those bonus fund system and they've been working great in, this, uh, in those districts. So how could we expand those uh, to a broader, uh, uh, area in the city. Uh, we have those green, uh, green advisory panel that have shown tremendous uh, performance improvement. How do we make more uh, developer benefit from those, uh, those feedback from, from the expert community in Pittsburgh? Um, and then the education. We've been educating our, our public work staff and our planning staff about sustainability and net zero. And uh, we've seen great change and uh, understanding and, and commitment to the climate action plan from, from those interactions. How do we educate more department, more authorities, more partner, so that they become more familiar with the climate action goal and how they can help uh, meet them. And, and by uh, doing all of that, uh, we are hoping, we're confident that we're gonna see lots of improvement in 2021. Mm. Thank you, Flora. Um, just a follow-up question, I think it's from, um, from our Q&A. What, if any, are the next generation plans for benchmarking ordinance? Um, so we just selected a vendor, so we, uh, it's gonna be easier to uh, manage the data now and communicate and do the outreach. So we 
we're going to focus a lot on expanding the participation this year. We have over 65% participation, but we would like to shoot for more. Uh, we want to increase uh, regularity because we have uh, several buildings that benchmark one year and not the other. So try to understand why this did not happen and resolve that issue uh, to make sure the, the continuation is there. Uh, we also have been working with Duke and Light and they have uh, an aggregation uh, feature now that was essential for, for building with uh, several tenants to be able to benchmark somewhat easily. And now that this feature is available for both commercial and multifamily, we're gonna make a push for getting voluntary multifamily benchmarking because we have a lot of those large multifamily buildings and having the information of their energy usage is very important uh, for the future of the region. Thank you, Flor. Um, we also have with us uh, Sarah, who is also a part of uh, Grant's team. And uh, Sarah, you've been working a lot on the Energy Procurement Agreement. Could you uh, tell us a little more about what that implies and what's the future for it? Sure, yeah. Sarah, you are muted, I think. She says, there you are. Mm -hmm. Um, I called in on the phone because I think it was acting up on my computer a little bit, but um, I did also see in the chat that there was a question about elaborating on the 100% renewable goal for the city. So hopefully I can kind of um, incorporate that answer here as well. Um, as Katrine mentioned, I do help to run our energy procurement for the city, which includes um, operating the Western Pennsylvania Energy Consortium. And with that consortium, we procure energy for the city of Pittsburgh, but then we also have about 32 other entities um, in the nonprofit and public space in and around Pittsburgh that are a part of that consortium. And we've been, since about 2008, we've been collectively kind of pooling our electricity usage um, with the hope of reducing cost of electricity. Over the past um, again, about 12 years, we've been really successful in having a lot of budget certainty, um, again, reducing the cost for all of our members. And then in the past, we were slowly increasing our amount of renewable energy credits. Um, the typical contract for the energy consortium lasted about three years. And with each kind of new procurement cycle, we were adding in 5% more of renewable energy. Um, however, as we went through the process of developing the Climate Action Plan back in 2018 um, and our most recent contracts for energy procurement kind of um, were set to expire, we really looked at how well we were performing um, in relation to a lot of the strategies in the Climate Action Plan and a lot of the goals the mayor has set forth um, and realized that while we would technically get there by 2030, um, it wasn't really enough. Um, to have the emissions reductions that we were really targeting. And so over the past about year and a half, we've really reworked the energy consortium. Um, we've moved away from just basing everything on price and have started to um, create a new structure that really enables us um, to procure more renewable electricity. Um, and so this past May, we did sign a one-year contract. So for May 2020 to May 2021, um, we ramped up that renewable energy credit purchase to 100%. Um, so currently all city facilities, um, as well as the facilities of another a number of other entities within the city um, are covered with that 100% renewable electricity um, through the purchase of RECs. And so we do use that as kind of, um, it has again, kind of really scaled up the amount of renewable energy we're using, um, but it's kind of a placeholder, I would say also. So we did, accomplished the initial goal, but we've also reworked what that goal looks like in the process. Um, and so while we did have that goal of 100% renewable, we began, began to focus more on local renewable. Um, so with the new structure um, and kind of new phase of the Western Pennsylvania Energy Consortium, we're targeting how we can turn those um, kind of just general renewable energy credits into localized um, development of renewable electricity. And so moving forward in 2021, we expect to, um, we're actually in the process right now of selecting a new electricity supplier. Um, that RFP is currently kind of on the ground and we'll make, be making a selection in January. Um, and then with that new supplier, 
We hope to be rele releasing RFPs for power purchase agreements um, and additional renewable resources, again, on a more localized basis. So we're looking at um, prioritizing Allegheny County, but in general, looking for renewable projects within southwestern Pennsylvania that um, can more directly supply electricity to the energy consortium. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah, while I have you, you, I know you've also been working on an uh, energy master plan that's coming out very soon. Could you tell us a little more about that too? Yeah, so we do, um, as Grant showed kind of quickly in the beginning of his um, presentation, we have this kind of growing um, chain of plans that we've been working on and they really help to build upon each other. Um, and one that we're in the final stages of development and kind of the editing phase is the Municipal Energy Master Plan. Um, when we talk about our climate goals and our energy goals, there's that overarching 50% emissions reduction goal. Um, but then underneath that, we kind of break our goals up into two categories, one being um, citywide. So how do we impact energy and transportation on a citywide scale? But then we also look at how do we um, kind of as the city of Pittsburgh operating um, as an entity with 3,000 employees um, and a fleet of vehicles and a fleet of buildings, how do we improve our operations um, and what are the goals that we have kind of internalized. And so with that municipal energy master plan, um, which will hopefully be depending on kind of how things fall around the holidays, will either be um, released later this month or early January. Um, we look at how we can specifically tar have targeted actions within city operations. Um, so building upon things like the um, benchmarking data and the benchmarking reports that Floor has pulled together um, and some of the EV procurements that Grant mentioned, um, how do we really tie all these different pieces together in a targeted way um, to have that strategy for internal operations and reaching some of those um, city specific, city operation specific goals that are laid out in the climate action plan. Um, so we see this as kind of, again, one more building block upon um, a lot of the goals and other strategies that we've laid out um, targeted specifically to internal operations and emissions related to city operations. Mm. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Anna, I think um, I think there's a lot more questions for us, but I think you want to keep pushing the 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 agenda. So um, I'm going to leave the word over to you, and then we might have time for some questions in the end. Thank you. Fantastic. So we will continue. There are great questions that are coming in. Please do continue adding those to the Q and A section. Um, and I'd like to have um, Tony Young and Elizabeth Cook and James Lodge all turn their cameras on, fantastic. Okay, so Sarah, I'm gonna move you, there we go. Okay, gallery view. So we're gonna move into our next sort of section of um, conversation today. And with us, we have um, great experts from our utility partners in town. And I use that term utility loosely because we have different types of utilities with us here today. So first we have Dr. Elizabeth Cook, um, who is with Duquesne Light Company, uh, um, who is our, uh, our distribution uh, partner for electricity in the region. We have Jim Lodge with Clearway Energy, um, who runs a plant in our, um, actually several plants across town, and he can speak to those. Um, and Tony Young, who is with the Carnegie Museums, has been doing this for um, quite a while as one of the leaders in the city in terms of energy generation through uh, several of our um, sort of localized power plants. So with that, and please, the first thing I'd like you to do is, is quickly um, add anything to my, uh, my very brief um, introduction if needed. Um, but I really wanna talk and speak to some of the, what the mayor said in terms of opportunities for the region and collaboration. So as we've talked about, uh, there are any number of things that we can be doing, to, doing together. So how, how are you all planning for additional opportunities and collaborations in the coming year? Ooh, and I'm gonna start with Elizabeth and then how about we'll do Jim and then Tony. Okay, hi. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> just to 
to clarify my role at Duquesne Light, I ultimately am in charge of the team that builds and runs all the system models to analyze the grid today. It's actually the transmission and distribution side. And as everyone is probably well aware that um, is tuned into the energy plan, there's a lot happening on the distribution side. You know, we as a utility of Pittsburgh has been evolving over the last 140 years we've grown out the transmission grid and we've served our customers through the distribution grid. And so as that uh, dynamic has changed, we have definitely has kind of shifted gears in wanting to better understand, you know, what are these active customers doing and how do we engage with them to really evolve into this new sustainability and transformation really of the grid. Um, so, my role now is really partnering with the local universities, finding those research areas that we can talk with, and then getting to the table, such as uh, meetings like this with the city of Pittsburgh, with our community members, and really listen in on what do you guys want to do, where are you headed, and how can we help with that transformation as the ones that serve the power. And just a little perspective, uh, Duquesne Light is a lines only company, so we do not own any generation. So we're the ones facilitating and wanting to understand where our generation sources are and then how to serve the customer. So it's uh, quite a dynamic role to be in between, I guess. So that's where I'm collaborating with all of you. <laughs> Jim? I yeah, so thanks, Anna. And I certainly a shout out to the mayor. Uh, I know you said it on Anna, but you know, we work Clearway works in a number of cities and to have the kind of leadership and vision that the mayor has um, really is what makes these projects happen and the collaboration that you're talking about. Um, it's key to have a, someone like, like the mayor to to really be the point person all along. I, I can't say that there's a lot of mayor here's the United States that even know what district energy is. So congratulations to him, you know, for everything that he does. Um, what I would say in terms of collaboration opportunities, so just to catch everybody up a little bit, over the last couple of years, Clearway's made a significant investment in sort of the lower hill uptown area. And it's really building blocks along the way. And I think this is something that can be replicated elsewhere, for example, in the Oakland area. Um, but specifically, we started with the development and construction of the plant that's right next to PPG Arena. That's a district energy plant that provides both steam, chilled water, and backup electricity, currently to UPMC Mercy. But ultimately, that plant was designed at that location specifically for future development in the Lower Hill area and other adjacent buildings in that area. The second key component of that was sort of a mixture of both adding new resources and utilization of existing resources. And you'll hear from, um, you know, Rod um, on the next panel from Duquesne University. But recently we acquired the, the district energy and CHP system at Duquesne. And that was critical because they had a bit other additional capacity that we could then connect two systems together. And in fact, that's what we've been doing this year through the pandemic is actually installing a pipe that connects now the Duquesne University system into the uptown system, which then frees up additional synergies, uh, you know, additional capacity, improved efficiencies, cost savings and so forth. And again, this is sort of the foundation for them what the mayor talked about, which was the lower hill area. So there's a couple sort of key opportunities that we're working on right now that, that use those efforts previously to be able to be the foundation for what we're able to do now. One of the things we're looking at doing is putting in a new hot water system. And in terms of collaboration, you know, there's really twofold here. One is we're focused on both energy efficiency on the demand side, um, which is the individual buildings, but then also on the supply side with the systems. This hot water system is actually going to be designed, you know, similar to the type of designs they use in Denmark. So the friends from the, the Danish Energy um, Advisory Group are going to be uh, very helpful for us in terms of being able to have that design and also the installation and the contractors work to be able to do that. Um, obviously, the city planning is important and then the GBA as well in terms of being able to to uh, um, look at the energy efficiencies that we'll be able to get from the buildings. And lastly, a uh, mayor talked about the older um, district steam system in, in downtown in the Golden Triangle area. So again, we look at these systems as a citywide effort 
to where you can begin to have interconnectivity. So in terms of improved resiliency, modernization, all of these things happen. And I guess key with uh, the, um, the modernization of the old PAC system downtown, that's one where, again, you've got an inefficient system that is going to show significant energy efficiency savings just on the distribution, the pipeline, and the efficiencies of a new, uh, new plant. In addition, as we work with the existing buildings to, to convert over to the new system, we're also looking at, again, demand savings kinds of opportunities, energy efficiencies within the building. So again, um, you know, it's the Green Building Alliance, there'll be help there. Obviously, the other resources is sort of your typical thing, Anna, where you've got consulting engineers, contractors, suppliers. And then finally, um, in terms of beyond just efficiency savings, as we look to reducing carbon emissions, one of the things that we're looking at, and this would be key, I think, for the universities and the research is biofuels. You know, we're looking at how do we convert some of our existing boilers over to different types of biofuels so that we can reduce emissions. So try to be quick, but there's a lot going on and a lot of different parts and pieces. And this absolutely can be replicated in the Oakland area. So I see this is just a, a preview of what can happen in Oakland as well. Thank you, Jim. Tony? Well, thank you, Anna. And uh, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge uh, two of my partners are gonna be speaking on the university side, Steve Gunther from CMU, as well as Scott Bernardis from uh, Pitt. Well, just a couple of things. Um, you know, the pandemic has kind of done a few things for us. It's really um, made the Oakland plant, which is probably, if not the oldest, one of the oldest um, district energy plants in the uh, in the city. It was built in 1907 for the museum to power DC generation and uh, heat. And uh, in the early 30s, it was uh, it was expanded to the Pitt campus and then continued to expand until 2009 and in 2009, the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC brought their Corolla Street plan online and we ended up going um, into a centralized system with two separate plants in two different parts of the city, just uh, connected through piping that had been in the ground and then just expanded. So from a pandemic's perspective, We've actually kind of looked at this now and said, okay, this is really where we're, where our baseline is at. And uh, one of my colleagues on the phone uh, had just mentioned this in a uh, meeting this morning that we've really been able to look at what we're, where we're at baseline. So what does it take without anybody in the buildings to manage the buildings? And then we've been able to kind of grow that, uh, that um, whole planning process going forward. So one of the things that we're gonna do is we're gonna run an exercise in the next month that's gonna look at where we're at uh, in each building that's on the system, as well as capabilities of each plant should we have a catastrophic failure or some kind of maintenance um, planning. And that collaboration between CMU, Pitt, the museum systems, FIPS, UPMC, the school district. I mean, you look at all these uh, for-profit, non-profit folks that are around the system, right? And everybody is, uh, doing their part. And the biggest thing we're running into right now, we've not had to expand the plants due to the fact that over the last probably 10 to 12 years, everybody on this system has taken uh, energy savings into consideration. And we've been able to utilize uh, that energy savings to kind of offset the ability that need to expand the plants. So that's the collaboration piece. One of the research things that we're looking at, you know, we're currently looking at um, kind of how we run the plants and how the plant is managed. And as we're looking at, now that we look at CHP, is there some kind of new uh, syngas as uh, Jim kind of talked about some different firing mechanisms on how we're gonna make steam. What do we do in the future with hot water conversion in uh, some of the buildings that don't need direct steam humidification? So if you look at those type of things, I mean, I think the research that's going on on a daily basis and I think the pandemic has really kind of sped this up because it's really um, gonna start looking at this whole global warming and people are really starting to kind of uh, step back and take a look at what's going on with those type of things so that we can kind of um, see where that uh, research is gonna go. And obviously the Marshall Plan is gonna be, a big, uh, gonna be a big component of that if we look at what do we look at from distribution. And then, you know, just the challenges is potential utility um, 
utilities consolidation, um, just the cost of infrastructure. Jim will probably be uh, better, to, easier to talk to this than uh, I would, but just trying to put infrastructure in the ground. Uh, I'm sure Elizabeth's uh, team, as well as Jim's team, is well aware of just the cost to take and, and move a pipe from, you know, wherever your plant is at, down Fifth Avenue, up Penn Avenue. So I think that's going to be one of the um, potential issues that we're going to have. One of the things that I see is that we use the existing infrastructure and add different technology in those switching stations, whether it be for steam or hot water or electricity, and, and change, use the existing infrastructure and then just change the production of how that utility gets and then basically upgrade the infrastructure as we go forward. I really think that's the, gonna be the biggest challenge. It's just the cost of going into a, a city that its industrial base is a hundred years old. And it, you know, when you open up a hole in the ground in this city, you never know what you're gonna find from you know, old uh, electricity lines or steam lines or water lines or you name it. So that's pretty much uh, my thought. Thank you, Tony. So Elizabeth, I want to go back to you. There were a number of things that were that our, our colleagues have mentioned, but I want to give you a chance to actually speak to some of those research ideas, collaboration ideas, and sort of future thinking. Are there other cities or systems that we should be looking at um, in our final minutes before we go to our next panel? What oh, we can't hear you. Well. One thing that um, we just embarked upon was doing a study to better understand the, the, the clean generation source that's running through our wires. And from that study, it was um, not surprising that gas is still you know, not as clean as the grid. But what we did see is because of our content around the can light, such as the nuclear, the increase in solar, and then even the wind per se, our carbon content is actually quite clean. And so what we want to do with that understanding is kind of be proactive with our partnerships in regards to the technology and really how do we look at the demand side of energy, right? Increasing efficiencies where needed. So we don't have to increase or build out our infrastructure, but we can work with the customer's human behavior to really reduce the energy load, um, utilizing demand response programs, energy efficiency programs, thinking about aggregating DER to help benefit and stack rank the goals. So those areas of research are huge right now for us, uh, getting into machine learning and kind of the deluge of all of the data that's available to us. And then how can we understand the utilization of our grid and then work with the human behaviors to really reduce mm. the infrastructure build out. Um, so in that study, Oakland did pop up as being a very highly um, sourced energy, a lot of energy being used in the Oakland concentrated area. So we're going to be definitely focusing in that um, neighborhood first and then kind of work out to the other ones that were identified. So, uh, so that's kind of really the research area. Okay. Yeah, the demand side and then looking at buildings and how can they be more efficient and we work with the grid, right? Um, I think the other one was, you know, our challenges are similar to yours. You know, anytime we want to build out new infrastructure is quite difficult, right? Opening up the streets, especially in the underground facilities. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're kind of looking at non-wire alternatives as solutions in our uh, back of pocket, uh, which is where the research part comes in. And in regards to COVID, I would say our resiliency planning definitely has stepped up. We're more focused. We were, you know, concentrating in the areas of our grids that were, um, you know, being highly utilized, such as the research labs and the, the hospitals, right? Uh, just kind of focusing in on that area, understanding the utilization with a more granular eye per se than maybe before the, the pandemic. But now moving forward, it's, we kind of created those processes and we'll continue to implement those throughout. Um, but it really didn't, uh, I mean, we had to delay some of our projects to refocus, but we're kind of back working towards keeping the grid up and running, doing the nuts and bolts tackling. Um, so. Oh, and just so you know, Oakland's utilization, we didn't see a dip. Uh, it was actually one of our peak year uh, summers throughout uh, COVID, which was kind of interesting uh, to see. So, so why do you thought. think that would be? And maybe Tony can chime in on that one too. We're, look, we're digging into the 
but yeah, you know, hospitals didn't calm down, right? So Oakland is filled with a lot of hospitals. Also, the research labs, you know, and all the work that's being done in all those labs didn't shut down. So uh, also, if you think about it, our summer typically don't have students um, there anyway. So that was, you know, they were not there as much, but really not any. Uh, so just that was, but Oakland's very different than like the holistic grid of the two counties that we serve just because of the high uh, penetration of energy usage. But those are our, some of the findings we've seen. Great, so I, I know we're, Tony, go ahead, please. Yeah, just to, just to kind of, Anna, just to kind of loop back around. Yeah, the two, I mean, the energy intensity of uh, hospitals as well as research facilities, uh, I think is really what has kind of led to that not dropping. We've seen in residence halls, obviously, if there's nobody there, we don't see that big spike in the morning. We, we know when the kids are back and when, they're, when the students are back, and when they're not back, it's due to the fact that we see that spike starting at about 6.30 to about 8.30, 9 o'clock. We see that big spike. Everybody's getting up, taking a shower, doing all the things that they're getting ready to do their day. And then they kind of, and then it kind of comes back down a little bit afterwards. But uh, I would say that from Elizabeth's perspective, it's because everybody was just kind of full tilt with uh, research and development and what's going on in, uh, and UPMC as well as Pitt and CMU's doing a lot of that, um, you know, some research still uh, through the summer that typically they wouldn't do. Well, thank you. I realize that we're already at the end of time. It seems like we could do a, continue with this conversation. Well, uh, what I want to do now is I want to have our next panel um, turn their cameras on. So that would be Grant. All right, we're going to have a little switch over here and I'm going to turn my camera off. That's great. Thanks, thanks, Anna, and thanks to that panel. Um, so, so with me here, uh, let me see. Let me switch my view. Um, so, I, I have with me uh, our facilities operators uh, from the universities. Um, and I want to thank uh, Rod Dobish and Steve Gunther and Scott Bernotis uh, from Duquesne University, Carnegie Mellon University, and University of Pittsburgh, respectively, uh, joining us here today. Uh, maybe one just to pick up from that last panel. Um, you know, and, and really because you guys have oversight of operations of the facilities uh, in each of your campuses. Um, and Rod, maybe I'll start with you, but could you each of you provide your reflection of operations of your campuses during this pandemic? Um, just things that you've experienced or, um, uh, you know, just things that you can kind of glean in, into the uh, uh, experience over the last nine plus months or so. Sure, I'll, I'll start off. Um, I, I will tell you, we are fortunate at our institution that our provost is an epidemiologist by trade. <laughs> um, he basically um, met with a bunch of us in January and he was spot on exactly how this was going to progress. So we, we actually got a, uh, I think, a head start on a lot of this. Um, and we were fortunate from the standpoint that, you know, we purchased uh, all the uh, uh, protective equipment that we needed uh, because we really wanted to, to the extent possible, to have our students have the college experience. The, the number one reason that people pick Duquesne is because of our, our campus and our location and proximity to uh, downtown Pittsburgh. And so we, we really focused our efforts on, on that. You know, we had a reduced resident hall capacity. Um, we, we did, we spent, I, I cannot tell you how much money we spent. We put up probably 50,000 signs on campus. Uh, we spent about $50,000 on plexiglass for forward facing activities. Um, we rented a hotel for quarantine students, um, and we, we really put together a comprehensive plan on all the, the things, and we, we worked diligently over the summer, and I'm, I'm happy to say through some of the, the random testing that we did, we made it to our goal for this fall. Uh, is to get through Thanksgiving and we're doing the rest of the semester uh, remotely. Uh, but I mean, it really took 
people in my world to, we really had to step out of our, our current operations and we really had to take the lead in getting a lot of those, this stuff done. So I can just tell you that the, the focus of us has been, you know, A, getting the campus ready and two, making sure the building systems were there to uh, prevent the spread of this. Great. Steve and, and then maybe Scott. Thanks, Greg. Great to be here on the panel. And I'm, I'm going to start with just the, the applause to all the essential workers. Uh, from an operations perspective on our campus, uh, we've got staff that continues to report daily to work to make sure that the campus is safe uh, in all aspects. Uh, we've got an ongoing joke in our department going years back that there's some days that plumbers are more important than vice presidents. Uh, and with this pandemic, the role of our custodial services staff from the beginning uh, was elevated very high in the level of importance. Uh, and we salute those folks that are continuing through the holidays to make sure that the campus remains safe. Uh, lots of the things that Rod talks about uh, have happened here as well. We, we are thankful for the support of the university administration. Uh, in many cases, they had the foresight to uh, invest in ideas that hadn't yet been proven out but uh, were deemed to be strategies to get us to a place where we could host students in our classrooms, in our residence halls safely uh, throughout the semester. And uh, the experience that we had through the point where we wished them well over the Thanksgiving break as they returned home to virtual instruction, uh, we were by all measures as successful as the other institutions on this panel as maintaining a safe environment for the college age students and look forward to their return in the spring. Great, terrific. Scott? Unmute my microphone there. So uh, I would echo just exactly what uh, Rod and Steve said. You know, I'd say on a very tactical level, uh, you know, as Tony talked about the resiliency scenarios, because, you know, there's, there's an obvious, there's only so many operators in an energy plant. Uh, We've also seen, you know, we spent the summer in a sprint uh, to go through and modify all our HVAC units to meet the outdoor air requirements. So, you know, on that sense, we've seen an increased, uh, increased HVAC consumption due to mm -hmm. lower efficiency. Uh, but we've also seen, you know, less people in their offices turning lights on. So it's kind of a mixed bag there. Um, our research labs dormitories were still fully functioning. Uh, our research labs in particular, the critical labs kept running from day one in March all the way through. Um, uh, and and you know, clearly there are economic impacts from the, um, from the pandemic. We're bullishly, uh, but cautiously optimistic as we move forward with our capital plans, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but uh, resiliency and energy to, to steal your line, Grant. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to put that first, uh, energy first, your line. And, and the, what we're trying to say is these are the projects that pay back. So we did an energy master plan in 2018. Uh, you could, you know, that could move to the back burner as we, as we trim back our budgets. But we're trying to promote the this is you know these projects will pay back now and in the long term and so we're trying to we're, those are continuing to move forward uh, you know we're looking forward also focusing on our two major uh, PPAs for resiliency and that's kind of what I would say on the energy side. You know maybe just to pick up with that um, because each of you uh, not just you specifically but um, you guys are big parts of these these moves. Each of the universities have had, uh, you know, a major project or made a major investment um, through the course of the pandemic. Um, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, Scott, you know, specifically with Pitt, uh, you guys have made uh, this major energy purchase uh, with regards to an investment in hydro in the region. So maybe if you could talk about that and then going backwards, you know, uh, as Steve and, and Rod, you know, whether it's the Tepper building or the field house, if you guys can talk a little bit from your perspective of how, how those major projects and decisions have advanced even during the time of the pandemic. But Scott, maybe let's start with you and, and talk about Pitt's purchase of, of renewables. Right, I, I think, as you know, we, 
Pitts made a commitment to go carbon neutral in 2037. Um, but, and so it's, it's a little more challenging now because resources are tighter. Um, but I, you know, I just say, you know, from our, from the very top of our leadership on down through us, it's, you know, these, these are the right moves to make even now. And so we're, we know in everything that we're constructing right now, we've got to put energy first because it's gonna, it's gonna be what carries us down the road. I don't know if that answers your question. Grant. It does, it's perfect, yeah. Steve, how about from CMU standpoint? Yeah, yeah I'll add, and I'll, I'll even dial the history back further because I think it tees up the conversation and also with Pitt's uh, commitments on board. So uh, CMU, since our baseline in 2005, we reduced our greenhouse gas footprint by 70%. And that's with increasing space on campus by 20% and student headcount by 25. So it's been a long-term commitment and, and the university continues want to demonstrate leadership through action. Um, the three ways that we've been able to make that reduction that have made the biggest impacts. First is uh, to a previous panel as Tony's leadership uh, over the Belfield boiler plant and the push to uh, take coal out of that plant. Uh, not only to reduce the greenhouse gas, but also to improve emissions uh, and help of the air quality in the Oakland region, tremendous impact. Uh, the second is our commitment to green power. Back in 2001, we made at that point, which was the largest wind power purchase in the US. And that was only 5% of the university's uh, energy consumption. Looking at uh, where we've come to since then, uh, 10 years later, we made a commitment to 100% green energy, primarily through a REC strategy. And then three years ago, we made a commitment to buying 100% physical renewable power with RECs as well. Uh, just two weeks ago, looking at what the markets have done, came down to a strike price where we extended that commitment to buying physical renewable power an additional two years out through 2026. So we, we're, we, we enjoy the benefits of being able to make a commitment to physical renewable power here in the PGM grid. And then finally, a commitment on buildings. Uh, as we continue to look at the users and how do we primarily first priority is to have a resilient and reliable energy source so that we can continue to meet the needs of a vibrant campus. But how do we do that while reducing the energy intensity? And we continue through renovation as well as development of new properties and the commitment that we've had to meeting lead standards for energy efficiency continue to drive the energy intensity of our building portfolio down. That's terrific. And, and Rod, yourself, uh, I mean, you guys made the, the, the new transaction with, with Clearways, but also the, the development of the, the Cooper Fieldhouse during the pandemic. Correct. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it continued, it, it fell behind a couple months when everything got shut down, but it's, it's progressing pretty well. Hopefully we'll have a February opening date. Um, but one of the things I just want to follow up on what Jim uh, Lodge said, we, we actually are just at the point where we're completing the interconnection of those plants. And it's something that, you know, our focus has uh, been lately is to get out of the the energy management business and we partnered with Clearway so they can operate it so we can actually focus on the building side of things and the demand side of the, of the house. Our next development that we're doing is, um, you probably saw the announcement is our College of Osteopathic Medicine, which is at, mm -hmm. right across the street from um, the Cooper Field House. And um, I'm happy to report we're, we're, we're close to getting a deal to, to connect that to the district energy. Uh, that plays in part with the Eco Innovation District and some of the goals that the city has. But our projects are, are continuing um, and um, it's been, been a challenge to, to work through this, but we, we were very successful. Awesome. Um, just, just one quick final question for all of you, um, and I'll go back in, in reverse order here and hit you, uh, Rod, first, um, just because I like to pick on you. Um, oh, yeah, and it's same here, Grant. <laughs> um, what, what do you guys see up ahead in 2021, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, energy and kind of things that are on your, your whiteboard um, as, as university facility leaders? Uh, from our standpoint is to look on the demand side to, to, to really try to reduce, um, you know, costs where we're at because, you know, 
all the schools know this, we're, we're in probably the most competitive time in higher ed with, uh, with the um, uh, declining birth rate. And, you know, there's going to be a cliff in 2026 when the graduates really drop off from high school. But anything that we can do to, to, to help our institution, um, you know, sustain itself, um, you know, I, I think one of the challenges some higher ed things are going to face, and it's been, been talked about for years, some of these so smaller schools just may not make it. Um, so it, there, there's some significant challenges that we have going forward, but uh, anything we can do to make our institutions uh, stronger, uh, that's what our focus is. That's terrific. Great. Steve, um, and, I, and as part of that question, I would be remiss to also have you maybe explain your background and your pin. Um, I think it, beneficial for the audience here. Yeah, would love to. I'll start with that. So uh, the, the background is our color wheel. That's the represents the sustainable development goals that were uh, uh, outlined by the United Nations, better known as the global goals. So our uh, provost a little over a year ago uh, in conjunction with the UN Climate Summit in New York made a commitment with other Pittsburgh leaders. He was joined there on the stage with the leadership from Pitt uh, from Chatham, from the Pittsburgh Foundation, and our mayor, who kicked off this event, was there as well to demonstrate leadership in Pittsburgh related to the global goals. Uh, we recently published our voluntary university review, and we're very happy recently to see the Pittsburgh publishing their voluntary local review. So congratulations to the city. Uh, we you. continue to use the global goals, global goals as our framework uh, to align universities' actions in education, research, and practice to help build a more sustainable future. And so we've really enjoyed over the last year engaging the campus community. Uh, turning and pivoting to 2021, uh, what we look uh, forward to, and I'll uh, bring it back to the topic on, on this panel, is we'll complete an 18-month planning effort on a utility uh, campus utility planning. Uh, done in conjunction with, we've just recently launched our institutional master planning effort. And so we thought that the timing of a utility plan overlapping with the beginning of a utility plan uh, made a lot of sense to make sure that we didn't have pathways for utilities competing with pathways for building development. And it also fits in really well with the work that's been done at Pitt for the, uh, their utility plan and what the city is doing in the Oakland neighborhood. So we look forward in 2021 to really taking and, and harvesting the fruits of the investment in these strategic plans and looking at how we can work together to make a stronger Oakland community. Awesome, thanks. Scott, what's, what's on your whiteboard? So uh, first and foremost, getting ready for the students coming back uh, in spring. So we'll be adopting our lessons learned. That's our current uh, effort before the holiday is, uh, is get those in place. Uh, on the energy side in particular, you know, we've got a number of key infrastructure projects that we're looking at, uh, a lot of stormwater reuse opportunities, um, uh, uh, chilled water uh, resiliency projects. So really would like to get those moving. Um, and then just following up on the next phase, right? So we worked through the 16 buildings originally we had a little bit of a COVID pause, and then we got back on to uh, you know, working our way through those other buildings as part of the energy master plan. And then, uh, you know, just working our way through the IMP process, and uh, that's what we're looking forward to. Excellent. Well, I want to thank all of you for your leadership and, and the work that you guys do, um, not just on facilities planning, but also being le leaders in the energy space here in Pittsburgh. Um, you guys are doing tremendous things uh, in each of your universities that uh, benefit us as a city as a whole. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to uh, turn it back over to you. And I think I got us back on time. Yeah, I think we just have a few additional questions. In fact, we have questions from the audience. And what I've done during the last couple of minutes is, um, and so if you all, um, just so you're not on the hot spot for answering these questions, because some of them are hard, I'm going to... Uh, if you guys turn your cameras off, then we well, This will... is like finals week, right? So That's we... right. That's exactly right. So thank you. Uh, thank you for all of our panelists today. Grant, I have a couple of questions and there's, there's so many good questions that have come in from the audience. I appreciate all of the questions that have come in. I'm gonna group them together, but I, I wanna start by reiterating one thing um, that my colleague Steven said, which was education, research and practice. 
because I think that when we talk about the sustainable development goals and we talk about the city of Pittsburgh, we talk about our institutions, it's a really good way of sort of framing out what we're trying to accomplish here. How can we use uh, all of our people? <laughs> How can we use our students? How can we use all of our populations in the region in terms of workforce and, and jobs? Um, how can we create technologies and research that are driving energy and clean energy performance over time? And then how do we really put all of that into action? So mm -hmm. I saw that as sort of a great funding mechanism for these couple of questions that have come in. So I've grouped a lot of the questions together. So the first question um, is around performance benchmarking and dashboarding. So there have been some suggestions that come in that say, how do I find all of these plans? How do I keep up? How are we doing against different cities? You know, why don't we take on something like lead for cities if we're doing all of this great work? And then a great question that's also come in from Marin Cook, uh, one of our faculty members, is you know, there's also some things in the region that are not helping our performance. Um, how do we actually in expand to a regional approach given all of the circumstances around us? So it's a multifaceted question, but it really focuses on how do we take what we know about ourselves? How do we continue to do better, continue to drive performance? let everyone know how we're doing so that yeah. we can showcase that to the world. And then also balance out with, you know, not everything that's happening in the region right now is, is perfect. So mm -hmm. how do we take that imperfection forward? Yeah, um, I, was, was that data question asked by Chris Gorenson from the CMU Policy Lab? <laughs> um, I'm not sure, but no, I don't but, think so. But uh, uh, we, had, yeah. we had a couple of anonymous questions that came in today, so I can't, I can't give all the shout outs. So, so uh, later on today, the, the, the data question is a good one. Um, one of the things is we have a project uh, where we're working with uh, Chris Gorenson over at the Heinz School and the uh, uh, Policy Innovation Lab that is uh, helping to design or co-design a, a data dashboard project. Um, and one of the things that uh, the genesis of it, because it, it, the question is, uh, um, I, I take it, it's a personal challenge that I see, is that we've really gone in the last six years from the data desert to the data oasis um, in terms of not understanding how systems work, performance, um, and, you know, through that time, and you, the one slide that I had where it shows kind of all the different research and, and reports that we've collaborated with folks on has generated a ton of data. Uh, and we have to be able to find ways to integrate it, display it, and use it as a more proactive decision support tool. Um, so that's part of the work that we're doing with, with Chris uh, and his team to first start to pilot some of those activities on city operations so that we can project that um, out to the public, um, both at kind of the, I'm going to say the micro level in terms of operations, but also some of these, these macro questions, right? Um, if we can start to determine what the right key performance indicators are to start to help us make some of those more uh, systemic level decisions. With regards to, um, you know, Marin's question is also another good one. You know, one of the key things that was the impetus for the Marshall Plan um, is understanding how we provide a positive, uh, scalable, clean energy vision um, across the region. Um, we understand as Pittsburgh, you know, we're a small piece of the puzzle in, in terms of a larger um, a, a larger picture. And one of the things that we've seen, which has given a lot of hope, has been the organizing that we've done with other cities throughout the Ohio Valley. And so, you know, whether that's uh, the work being done in, in smaller cities like uh, Huntington, Youngstown, and Dayton, or larger cities like Louisville, Cincinnati, uh, Columbus, and Pittsburgh, everyone is taking action on climate. Um, in different spaces, in different places, but there's a collective impact there. And that's why we felt the Marshall Plan was um, kind of an opportunity to bring that under an umbrella to create a larger regional vision that we can all um, put our oars in the water and row in the same direction. So another question, um, we are in, a, in a, a period where we've been talking a lot today about sort of the future, but we also have a lot of stake in the region in natural gas. And so there is a, a very strong reality there. Um, there are some questions that have come in about what is the role of natural gas is this in this the future? Because obviously we still have it. Um, and are there going to be um, companies that are that don't benefit um, that might maybe leave the region from an economic development perspective? How do we how do we kind of keep growing and keep momentum um, while also uh, thinking about carbon and emissions? 
Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And, it, you know, one of the things that uh, has been really, I think, imperative, and I'm going to take the, the last part of that question first, which is in the work that we've done with uh, uh, Bob Poland at UMass Amherst and the team at the Center for Sustainable Business at Pitt is the question of us doing nothing is a bigger detriment. Um, and so, you know, when the mayor talked about uh, just going forward with the status quo, we stand to lose 100,000 jobs across the region, um, 40,000 of those jobs throughout the, the communities of West Virginia alone, um, and then different proportions that are acutely impacted in certain counties throughout the region because of their disproportionate exposure to um, the oil and gas industry. Gas is going to be a part of our, our future in, for, our, for the foreseeable future. Um, and the question is, how do we, how do we re-engineer both organizational structures, processes, and practices to provide that just transition, to provide the on-ramp and the opportunity um, so that we can take those current industries and pivot them towards the future? You see this happening right now, and I know there's, this is, might sound as a cynical comment, but you see a lot of the, the, uh, the big majors in the oil industry pivoting towards this transition, whether it's looking at vehicle electrification, um, di diversifying their portfolio in terms of renewable assets. Um, they have the capabilities to operate at scale. And that's one of the challenges that we have to recognize if we wanna face the climate challenge head on is it's gonna require us to use some of our, our existing assets, um, but in a different way. Um, so that, that's the, the first play that I, I'd put that. I also think that what we're going to see is the development and germination and generation of new businesses and industries. And that's going to require us to think about within those existing structures a little bit differently. Um, you heard for some of the utility partners um, like Jim Lodge talking about uh, transitions to, to biofuels, for example, or renewable natural gas. That still requires us to leverage our existing pipeline infrastructure. It's just changing the, the source use of generation. Um, so it's gonna be about thinking about those structures differently. How do we deliver our services in a different way? Um, you know, for example, how do we develop uh, new heating services is really a big question that we have to answer with the entire uh, decarbonization movement. That doesn't mean that our traditional natural gas companies need to go away, but it might be about how we think about delivering those services in a different way. That's great. In our last couple of minutes, um, I have one a question about innovation. And it's interesting, even as I'm thinking about this, I'm getting texts, emails, chat, the stuff on my iPad. So we've got information coming in. Thank you <laughs> so much for all of the questions. Um, the question came in actually from our strong partner at the Center for Tech Transfer at Carnegie Mellon, Reed McManigal, who wants to know about innovation because we need to be piloting things. So will the Marshall Plan allow for funding? Are we going to be looking for funding so that we can really pilot technologies and be an ecosystem driver for new startups in energy and clean tech? So near and dear to our heart at the Scott Institute for sure. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we've, we've talked about um, within kind of the Marshall Plan is there's multiple tranches of investment, right? So I think the thing that gets the headline quickest is the, the need for federal support, right? And the federal government uh, provides kind of two big levers that they can pull. One is the ability to be a funding catalyst. The other is to be a guarantor of resources. Um, so whether that's loan programs or upfront grants and capital, those are two structures that are really important, I think, to the picture. But there's also the role of, of state government. You know, if I gave the example early on in our presentation about um, the grant that we recently received from the Pennsylvania Energy Development Authority for vehicle electrification. That's a critical investment for us to lay that, what we call kind of the, the first pipe, um, the first pipe connection from the source to the, the charging unit. You know, and so we've been collaborating with Duquesne Light and the Parking Authority um, and others to help make that happen. But that first in investment is basically the catalyst for that project, um, which will allow us to scale. The third piece is the idea about procurement. Um, so we make a lot of these decisions and you heard them um, just in the last panel in terms of making procurement decisions uh, with regards to renewable electricity, you know, Carnegie Mellon, Duquesne, Pitt, the city of Pittsburgh. 
we're making investments strategically in those assets, not just because uh, you know it's something nice to do, but it's economically feasible to do it. You know, so it's linking your value chain with your supply chain. And then I think the next horizon is the opportunity with regards to pension funds. Um, and this has been kind of the critical conversation that we've had with organizations like the Heartland Investors Network, which is a collection of, of labor pension funds where pension assets are strategically seeking clean energy investments. Um, and so that matchmaking between city and university projects and the ability to patriate private capital into those is another kind of tranche. You know, so <laughs> pensions, procurement, federal state investment, it's a layer cake approach in terms of building that capital stack. Fantastic. So insightful dialogue this morning. Grant, I appreciate working with you to pull this together and thank you for the opportunity. Obviously, thank you again to the mayor uh, for joining us. We are at the end of time and I wanna be sensitive to that. We've kept everyone for two hours this morning. Do you have any final comments? Just, I, I just offer one thank you, Anna, and to the, the team at the Scott Institute and to everybody, I think, a part of the, you know, the Pittsburgh energy ecosystem. It's just a, such an impressive group of people and really doing amazing things. Um, so it's great that we can uh, just come together and celebrate that and then uh, start to pivot towards a, a new year here in 2021. And, and maybe 2021 does offer a lot of change <laughs> and updates. So that's good. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, and so behalf, on behalf of the city of Pittsburgh and the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation at Carnegie Mellon, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you in the new year with additional programming. Um, we do have a lot of opportunities and those of you who are on this call today will receive our newsletter um, and that has all of our upcoming programming. So thank you again for being here and um, happy holidays, safe travels, be well. Great, thank you.